Awesome. Thanks, Noah, for that killer introduction. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Rob. Uh, I will be giving this talk on leading your game's production. Um, like Noah mentioned, I'll be keeping an eye on the talks text channel. So any questions there, feel free to throw them in. Um, if I'm going too fast, if you want me to jump back a slide, anything like that, um, let me know. So yeah, talk is definitely appropriate for all skill levels. Um, while we are talking about leadership, uh, just because you might not be in a leadership role doesn't mean you might not find valuable things in here. I kind of aim this for uh, people who are in leadership roles as well as people who would like to be or at least like some of those skills. Um, it's aimed at both small and larger teams. Um, some of the, the info and concepts and advice in here might not be applicable um, to small or larger, but um, there's definitely that's uh, information here that can be applied to either or and sometimes both. Um, I've kind of divided it up into abstract and pra practical skills. Um, abstract being things that are more like concepts, um, you know, things like uh, different forms of communication, that sort of thing. And then practical skills are more like, how do you run a meeting? How do you make a good meeting? Uh, or how do you run a good meeting? Um, and then advice that I've um, picked up along the way or um, have learned myself. Uh, and as mentioned, I'll be engaging during the chat, so feel free to ask questions. So hi, my name is Rob. <clears throat> I'm a producer on Subnautica 2 um, at Unknown Worlds. Previously, I was working on Moonbreaker uh, at Unknown Worlds. Um, I joined up with them in 2022. We are a remote game studio distributed across the world, um, but having a lot of fun working on Subnautica. It's, uh, it's a good project to be chipping away at. Uh, I'm also an indie game developer and music composer. I've released a game called A Small Robot Story on Steam, and then some small um, indie games, uh, or rather uh, game jam games um, that are all on my itch. And then I'm also a music composer, which is how I kind of got into games. Um, composed for a game called Halloween is Forever, a couple other small projects, and I'm currently working on a game with a buddy called uh, named Jason Wilder, um, a uh, Game Boy game, uh, GB Studio game. So doing some tracking uh, music for that. Also a visual artist. Uh, my previous profession was graphic designer, and that's informed a lot of what I know now. Um, I'm a big geocache seeker. Um, this is just a side thing, but geocaches are wonderful. Definitely check them out if you like real life side quests. That's exactly what they are. Um, and then I'm a big retro game enthusiast, uh, currently playing through the entire Legacy of Kane series. Um, and Absolutely loving reliving my uh, goth teen years uh, now in my 40s. So that's little little tidbits about me. Um, <clears throat> so my background, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about um, the experiences I've had, professional experiences and creative experiences I've had. Um, obviously, it's a little bit of a, a horn to a little bit of a humble brag, but the intention here is that these are the experiences that I've had that have informed this talk, um, that have informed my lens, my perspective, my point of view um, about how I approach leadership. Um, and it's all because of these experiences and things that I set out to learn or things I learned along the way um, and how I now utilize uh, or use in my toolbox, as we call it. So the first would be Rochester Chip. Uh, this was a monthly uh, chiptune show that I co-founded with a good friend, Nick, um, and we ran it from 2010 to 2013. Uh, it was a, basically a concert series where we invited local chiptune bands and regional chiptune bands to come play around town. We would have shows at like the Bug Jar downtown and basements and attics. Um, it was very, very uh, what we call DIY, do-it-yourself uh, underground music scene. Um, very similar if you've ever been involved in like the punk underground scene or indie underground scene. We were doing that, but with chiptune music. Um, and so my role with this was, um, at the time I was a graphic designer, I was making all the posters. And so I was really trying to draw attention to what we were doing and attract people who would be interested. So I kind of had to be mindful of like, okay, what are people who would like chiptune? What would catch their eye? Like what kind of posters, what kind of, um, you know, uh, what's something they would see that would bring them in. So like I kind of geared my work towards that. And then during our shows, I would help run shows, kind of be the conduit between the venue and the performers and the talent, as well as the uh, audience often. 
so the the leadership skills I learned here were like very do it yourself. Like, okay, let's just we're gonna get into it and we're gonna figure it out. Um, and we're gonna fumble along the way until we learn, you know, what things work and what things don't. Um, and yeah, we did that for three years. We held monthly concerts. We did a few workshops. We had um, a couple of festivals, which we held at RIT, which were super successful. Um, it was a great time, but again, it was one of my first steps into into leadership. Um, after that, Rock Game Dev, which we are currently experiencing right now. Um, so I co-founded this in 2015 and acted as the director until 2022. And again, the leadership skills here were building a community, really looking, um, or excuse me, meeting the community's needs, as well as <clears throat> growing programming, um, establishing a bigger footprint. Um, it, it was really, and I'm going to talk about this this type of leadership in a bit, what we call servant leadership, where you are looking at what the needs are of your community or your team, and then trying to find out how to provide that for them, basically unblocking them, right? So I was seeing what what did the community need? It started as just a single meetup <laughs> a month, like it was one event a month. And then there was more requests, like people were like, it would be great, like, just to hang out. And so hence the social meetup was born. Um, those are the sort of leadership skills that I developed there, like talking to the community, seeing what they needed, um, and then kind of brainstorming around that. Uh, during that same time, I was the digital games hub coordinator at Magic at RIT. And so this skill sh or skills that I developed here were kind of what I call a conduit, right? I wasn't necessarily a subject matter expert. Like I couldn't tell you how to develop a VR game, but I had a high level understanding of how VR development worked. So I was basically connecting the askers to the knowers. Um, I could kind of do an introductory talk like, oh yeah, you would want to have a budget and hire a team. You might need the, this many people on a VR team. Um, here's where those people are. Here's where you can kind of like find them or I can introduce you to them. So it was a lot of like fielding questions about game development, engaging newcomers or interested parties and making connections. So the skills here, again, acting as a conduit, a lot of public speaking, a lot of um, just kind of casual conversations, but also providing the information that people were looking for. Um, so on the other side of that was kind of like talking to the subject matter experts and having an understanding of what their needs were and what they were looking for um, and hopefully making those connections. And then lastly, Unknown Worlds. Um, I've been there since 2022. Uh, I mentioned producer on Moonbreaker and now Subnautica 2. And this is more classic production. Um, so, you know, I have to keep a mental map of the whole project and what it looks like and then how the teams I'm working with play into that. Um, making sure my teams have what they need, communicating between departments and within teams. Um, this talk will bring up production um, topics. But again, I'm trying to kind of gear it towards leadership in general. Uh, I do view leader, uh, production as leadership on teams. Um, but again, a lot of the skills and concepts I'm going to talk about can be applied if you are an animation lead or an engineering lead or QA lead um, or you know somebody who wants to step into one of those roles. Cool. Uh, next slide. So again, I mentioned these experiences. Plus, this is kind of my formula, if you will. These experiences, plus my personal experiences, plus what I know of leadership, have resulted in this talk. Um, that's kind of where all of this information is coming from. And this obviously includes like who I am as a person. I'm pretty introverted. Um, so there are things that have worked well for me as an introvert that might not work for you if you're more of an extrovert. Um, that's kind of where like, my personal experiences come in. Um, and then what I know of leadership, this is a constantly thing that I'm just like learning and like absorbing. Um, and so there's more to learn. There's more to even discard. Um, but currently where I'm at, that is this talk. Um, I want to be clear that this talk isn't full of answers. Um, it basically contains, like I said, what has worked for me um, and what I'm currently trying and exploring and what I'm working on as a leader. Um, I. I kind of feel like this is true of all talks. I used to have this mentality when I would go see a talk um, that I had to like absorb and you know implement 100% of what the person was thinking because they're successful. So everything they're saying is true. Um, but I don't think that's true. I don't think that's accurate. Um, you know, it it's depends on the person. It depends on the teams you're working with. 
Um, you know, there's things in here that have worked for some of my team members and things that haven't worked for others. And that's kind of, you know, I figured out, okay, these things don't work for them. I won't use it or don't work for them. I won't use it there. I'll use it with this team where it does work. But so if you walk away with, you know, 20% of this talk and you feel like, hey, yeah, there's something here I can try. I think that's great. Um, I don't want you to feel like you have to walk away with everything um, to, to implement. Um, something to be in mind of as a leader and at the center of this talk is people. Uh, they are the work. Um, I couldn't think of a better word there. Work doesn't feel great. But as a leader, people are who you're engaging with the most. They're who you are commuting, communicating with, who you're doing the work through, whether you're, you're the one deciding the work they're going to do or they're helping you decide the work. Um, you know, like I mentioned in servant leadership, where you're kind of engaging with them and seeing what they need. Um, and the, the important thing here is be kind, right? You're working with people. People are kind of the system you're moving through. Um, these are human beings. You need to be kind. You need to be, um, uh, um, you know, kind to the people you're working with and, and gentle. Um, I think that's a very, very true thing. So um, throughout this, I will continuously, <laughs> um, and I've tried this a few times, we'll see how it goes. I'll be giving examples, right? When I use a concept, I'll want to uh, provide an example of like a game. Um, like, okay, let's say you're doing this in the game. And so here's the game pitch. Uh, this is the idea. You can have this. I encourage any of you to take this and steal it um, and use this idea. But you are a cat whose human owns a bakery. Uh, they're terrible at it. So you as the cat go hunt for supplies and bake all night. Um, it's called Catatouille. And it's for fans of Moonlighter. Um, and that's the example I'll keep running back to. So I don't want to like jump around between game examples and kind of lose you. So that's the context we'll use. Um, if you do decide to make this game, uh, I would just like to make a song for it. That's all I ask. Cool. So that's part one. Uh, part two, uh, loose definition of leadership. Um, I just want to like quickly define what leadership is in, in a loose way. There's so, I did a Google search. There's so many definitions of leadership. Um, this is a great meme that my coworker John made uh, from the Dungeons and Dragon movie. It's the actual lines from the movie. Um, and it's like perfect leadership material. Um, pretty, pretty great stuff. So types of leaders. Um, the most obvious one is the visionary, the person who has this idea and can work on it themselves and make it happen and kind of bring people along and scoop people up in this idea. Um, this is your creative director. This is your game director. Um, you know, this is, this is the person on a smaller team who is maybe doing 80% of the project, but needs some additional help. Um, you know, we've all, I think as game developers, we all have ideas on how to make games. We're all visionaries in our own way. Um, but typically this is the person who kind of like is coming up with all of the work, right? Um, the ideas, the brainstormer. Um, they're really typically at what I would say the, the top, I guess you could say, um, of the structure. Um, but yeah, they're the person iterating um, and they're definitely not afraid of risk, right? They're trying something new, trying to push the balance with games um, and push things forward. Um, up next is the planner. And so this is the person who's in a leadership role, but interpreting the vision, right? The vision from the visionary. They're the one who, let's say, you know, the visionary can can talk about their idea and can document it, um, but maybe only like 30% of the team really understands that. Uh, the planner is the one who kind of interprets it, builds structure around it, build, builds a framework for getting the work done, and it can help interpret the work to the rest of the team, to like hopefully a majority of the team. Um, sometimes the visionary can get pretty far with a lot of this. But the planner's the one, again, who makes the idea actionable, builds a process around the idea. Uh, kind of the classic roles you'll see here is the visionary is the creative director or the game director, typically maybe you know creative director. The planner is the executive producer. These two kind of work in, in together. Um, you know, the person with the idea, the person trying to make the, sure the idea gets done, that kind of way. Um, you don't often see these two roles being held by one person um, unless you're on smaller teams. Um, that's a little more common. Um, then you have the motivator. Uh, this is the person who just believes in the idea and can help push it along. Typically, the visionary also plays this role. Um, 
it's just kind of innate that they have this idea and they just like believe in it so much that it's contagious to the rest of the team um and that it kind of helps the other team the rest of the team believe in it and push them along um this also you know the motivator can also be kind of part of what um a lead on a team might do you know we've all been in a game where you reach at like 50 60 70 percent mark and it's just it's not a slog but it's just like oh when is this game going to get done and there's still so much to do and that's kind of where the motivator comes in and helps like push the team along you know helps kind of like compare to where we've been and what we've done and like oh yeah this task it's similar to that task and you did that in a week so we're all, we're getting there you know it'll be done um i know this sounds this feels kind of like corporate culture but like it is a vital role that someone typically has to play in a team especially in larger teams where there's so much work to be done um and again i feel like in my experience, a lot of the visionaries I've seen are also a motivator, a cheerleader, if you will. Um, they just believe in the idea so truthfully and like in their heart that they can't help but be contagious about it. Um, and then I mentioned servant leadership. So the listener, they're listening to the team. What are their needs? Uh, what what are the fires that are currently going on that need to be put out? Um, you know, if we're being real casual, what's the vibe of the room? Okay, things feel a little bit off. I have to like dig into this a little bit and feel what's going on um very there's a very typical role of like a, a producer um producers are you know we're a fo force multiplier meant to help the team get work done you know either quicker or better or identify the right work um but again this is kind of what my role in rock game dev was was looking at what the needs of the community were and then trying to meet those needs um plus there's a whole there's so many more ideas of what a leaders are uh you know i did a google search and it was like top eight types of leaders or hey take this quiz and you are one of these six types of leaders um there's a lot of other types these are typically the ones i've seen in my experiences um working in games and obviously you can be you can take on multiple of these roles like i mentioned the visionary and the motivator um so yeah here's a here's a uh this isn't a quote but maybe a phrase of leaf um I'm going to say it and then I want to talk about it real quick. Um, but it is a leader should help the team achieve goals by making sure the vision is clearly articulated, universally understood, and that the team is doing the right work. So this came out of a discussion I was having at work about the idea of um, the, t the idea of team doing as little as little work as possible to meet the goal. Right. That sounds like we were like, oh, OK, that's so that sounds that sounds like a, let's talk about it. Let's like explore that. And we kind of dug around with it, but this is kind of where we landed, which is obviously a little bit longer. But um, I kind of broke down the three parts of this, and I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about that. Um, so clear vision, right? Making sure the vision is clearly articulated. And so I'm going to talk a lot about vision tonight. And the idea here is that that this is the core of the game, right? The vision of the game whether it's a GDD, you know, a game design doc, or it's a one stupid Trello card with one sentence in it that you just can't let go um, and keep looking at, um, and that's driving your game. It can be anything, but it's the vision. And the idea here is you have to have this clearly articulated so, so um, it makes sense and so it's actionable. Um, you know, it's really... Um, it's what is the game? What are the goals of this game or what we're trying to achieve? Or on a lower, more granular level, what are the goals of this sprint or milestone? Um, you know, what are we doing for these next two weeks? What's the vision? Uh, you know, let's, if we're making three cats for Catatouille, what's the vision of the cats? Is the Calico cat different than the Tabby cat? Like, what's the vision for these next two weeks as we like iterate on that? Um, and again, it can go all the way back up to like the main vision. But that has to be clear and understood by hopefully everybody on the team. Definitely harder as you get bigger. Um, and does this vision adhere to our design pillars, right? Um, the idea here, too, is that people do the work. And I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here into right work. But the vision should be, as people do work, it should be adhering to the vision. They should be doing what is called the right work. Um, if you are the vision maker, if you are the visionary, um, you're going to be working on this constantly. It's going to change. Um, 
hopefully not too much, but it's going to change. You know, games change as they get under through development. Um, and if you're not the visionary, you have to stay up to date on this. And it's tough to do because um, it's always changing. And um, there's it's just hard to see the whole thing. Um, but you have to be keeping an eye on that as a leader uh, of what the vision is. And so you need to then make sure it's universally understood. You all want to understand it as a leader, and then you want to make sure your team understands that. And so that is, you know, we often say, are we aligned on the vision? And the idea isn't necessarily alignment, is that we agree on it, but that we understand what it is and we agree to move forward with it. Um, you can, um, I forgot who it was that, said consensus is we all agree that this is the right idea alignment is that we don't all agree that this is the right idea but we agree to move forward with the, this idea so being universally understood is like you know everybody gets it and it also gives people the opportunity to speak up um ways you can approach this okay obviously you have design docs right but not everybody wants to read through that not everybody's good at reading through that or retains information that way um so we often document um you know we use we use notion for documentation but then we'll also put things in a visual format like miro um or you know more visual uh ways of representing the vision um it gives people the opportunity who just take in information to to um take it in differently um as well as talking to the team and making sure like hey you know we just did a bit let's say we did a big pivot we're no longer doing Calico Cats. We're now doing Himalayans. And the Himalayan gets like a buff to, you know, baking cinnamon rolls, let's say. Um, does that all make sense to everybody? And somebody could say like, I don't get it. Why, why would that the Himalayan cats to get that? And it gives you the opportunity to speak up about the vision and maybe discover if it isn't working or if it is. Um, and that then goes down to the right work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So... The right work, this is this is tough. This is hard to do. Um, we've all done work and then it gets thrown out and that sucks. And we, we want to try to avoid that. But the idea here is the more people understand the vision of the game, um, the better their chances are of like raising a flag and saying like, hey, I think we're doing the wrong thing here. You know, I think um, if we want our cat to hunt between 1 to 2 a.m., for supplies that's not going to give the player enough time to then bake um and i'm the one designing that system designing the timing system in the game and here's my issues with that the player is only going to be able to like go to one or two zones in an hour um so the more people understand the vision again the more opportunities they have to like identify that the work that they're doing um might not be aligned with the vision or is aligned with the vision and then they can hopefully do better work um, so again, this is that whole talk I had. Um, I'm exploring this right now. This feels good. It might change over time, but this is kind of like a definition of leadership that I, I felt pretty, pretty good about. All right, part three. Um, here are concepts that can inform your actionable steps. Um, oh, Ricky, I just saw your comment about Legacy of Kane. That's great. It's a great game. They're a little tough in, in this day and age. Uh, they haven't held up too well, but they're still great games. Anyways, part three. Uh, concepts that can inform your actionable steps. So these are a little bit abstract, but these I find useful for when I... Um, and in that moment, and this happens as a leader, people don't often tell you what to do. You have to discover the work. Um, so I turn to these concepts to say, okay, what do I need to do next? What are the steps I need to take? to find information, disseminate information, uh, find the answers, so on and so forth. Um, this is a great still from the Double Fine documentary um, called Psych Odyssey um, about um, Psychonauts 2. Highly recommended. Probably the best documentary I've seen on game development. But it's a point, um, Tim makes a great joke about these two were made the leads. I think one's an engineering lead, one's the art lead. Um, they were then made the like directors of a of a I think the VR uh, Psychonauts property they were going through because somebody left um, and they didn't really want to do it and then they had to do it anyway. Um, just a great funny quote. So communication, right? Um, what's the concept of communication? Um, pretty, I think this is a pretty standard one. This is something that comes up pretty often with leadership. You're doing a lot of communication. 
You're talking to a lot of people pretty often throughout your day. Um, but what you want to think about is what are you communicating? And this depends on your role, right? Um, if I am <clears throat> if I am the game director, I'm communicating the vision, right? And I'm communicating that down typically. Um, so I want to think about that. Like, okay, who, who do I need to tell what? Like, the animation team might not need to know about things that specifically deal with the engineering team unless it impacts them. So I don't want to distract them with that sort of stuff. Um, awesome, great link, Noah. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot to chew through on that documentary, but like, give yourself a couple of weeks. It's great. Um, so yeah, what are you or what are you communicating? You do not have to communicate everything. Um, think about what you need to communicate. Um, your team's doing work. You don't want to distract them any more than you need to. And so thinking about the content of your communication is pretty important. I will sit down, <clears throat> excuse me. I will sometimes sit down and draft my messages. We do a lot through Slack since we're remote and I will often draft things, read it. I won't take longer than 15 minutes with it. Um, but I'll just be like, am I telling them, you know, what they need to know here? They can always ask questions and follow up and they often do. Um, but I don't want to like send paragraph upon paragraph. Um, the first thing this person sees when they wake up, um, how is your communication happening? Um, is it through primarily through meetings in person meetings? Is it primarily through, um, you know, Zoom and Google Meet or Slack and Discord or email. Um, this does impact the communication, uh, especially written word through Slack and Discord and email. Um, written word will, it can and will be taking the wrong way. And I've done this. I've gotten DMs. I've read it. I've interpreted it away. I've started to feel a certain way about the situation. And then I go into a call and I'm like, oh, I was totally off on this. Um, and I went back and read it and was like, oh, I see how this happened now. And that's not the fault of that person. It's just, you know, the way I interpreted it. Um, so this is something to be mindful of. Um, there is definitely a skill to written word, you know, when you're dealing with Slack and Discord and email, um, to how you say things and how it's communicated. And again, this is different between different people. Um, there are certain people I have really, really casual um, you know, producer to lead conversations with. And there's others that are a little bit more, you know, just the facts, just the what, when, where, how, you know, how, that sort of thing, because that's what they appreciate and that's how they prefer to work. Um, so as a leader, you want to be thinking, how is your communication happening? Um, you know, we always hear, okay, does this need to be a meeting? Does it actually need to be just an async uh, update in Slack? Um, so think about those sort of things. Um, and then how are you as the leader doing it? You want to be mindful of how you're communicating different types of information, questions, updates. Um, you know, we, um, there's a few things I want to talk about here that I'm drawing from, um, Ben and Aaron over at Building Better Games. Um, they have a podcast, they have a course. I'm a fan of both. I highly recommend them. Um, they talk about shielding and amplifying. And this idea is that let's say you get information from, you know, the, the creative director of um, of Katatui and they're like, hey, the, the Calico Cat, I I had a I don't like Calico Cats. I don't think they're too great. Why do we need to have one? Um, I don't see the point in it. And you might say, well, like, well, I know that the you know, the communities like the idea of having a Calico Cat skin for the player um, that we've heard a lot about it. And so that might be information you decide, what well, do I want to do this? Do I want to tell the art team about this? Do I need to tell? I'm not really being told we shouldn't do it. I've just got an opinion from somebody. And so that's where you decide what to do with information. Um, and two of the things you can do are shield or amplify. Shielding is where you make a decision to say, the team doesn't really need to know about this. They're too busy um, with other work. This information, it's not a decision being passed down. It's just information or feedback. I'm going to hold on to it for now. <clears throat> I'm going to let them keep working. Um, I can always share it later or it can always come up again. And it's a decision, right? And you have to own that decision. It can be a tough one to make. Um, amplifying is the opposite. You get feedback or maybe it is a decision that needs to be passed along. You want to amplify this to the team. You want to say, hey, guys, this is important. Um, we heard this, this, and this. You know what? Uh, 
turns out the community isn't a fan of calico cats nobody really likes it the metrics on it are low use we should cut it and that sucks but you're amplifying the message um there's also the idea of pass through which is like you're just passing information along and not really providing a directive along with it um but i think amplification and shielding are two things you want to think about doing with you uh communication when you're the leader um also uh something to be mindful of is critical information uh or input or feedback um it's a good idea with that sort of stuff to like follow up uh with it whether it's an email or um a slack message um i do this with like decisions we make like I, we make a decision in a meeting i'll put it in the notes i'll also share it in the slack channel like i want it to be living in different places at the same time so the team sees it depending on how they see information or stumble across it so that's the idea of communication um decision making so i got a couple of tools here uh the first is the eisenhower matrix um so this is, I tend to use this a lot just for myself when I'm making decisions. Um, and the idea is you have two axes here. On the X axis, you have urgent and not urgent. And on the Y, you have not important and important. And so you need to know two of those four. Um, is this decision, um, let's say it's important and not urgent. Okay, you schedule it. Um, and the idea is there that it is important to do and you want to do it, but it doesn't have to be done right now. So I can schedule it for Thursday. Um, but let's say it's urgent, but not important. It's something I can delegate as a leader, right? Um, okay, this does need to be done now, but it's not super important. I can give it to somebody who um, maybe might take a little bit longer to work through it because they don't have the either experience or information I do, or it's just something they can do when they have, um, you know, ads, um, when they kind of like, have the time for it. Um, so I'm comfortable delegating it, even though it's urgent. Um, and you can see it's the examples here provide like, OK, how crucial or how important is this? Um, so this is uh, again, I primarily use this just for like my own personal tasks. Um, and it's pretty, pretty helpful to do when I'm like starting my day and looking at, <laughs> you know, my task list and like, OK, what do I what do I need to chew through here? I'm going to take a quick drink of water. OK. Um, so yeah, Eisenhower matrix. Um, next, we have the RACI chart. So this is very common in um, the tech field and a lot of um, corporate, a lot of corporate use for this. Um, but it's an acronym. It stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. And the idea is those are roles that people around a decision would then take on or be assigned. Um, and so I found this wonderful example of Lord of the Rings, which provides a little bit more context if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings. Um, but these roles are, uh, they work as follows. So Responsible is the person who would um, be doing the work. Uh, of the that the decision of the decision or and or that the person who would be making that decision who would be the one that decides here's what we're doing uh, accountable they are the person who is responsible for the completion of the work but they might not be doing it themselves so this might be somebody like a lead um, a producer um, they want to make sure that work gets done but again they're not the one doing it but they are you know making sure it does get done uh, consulted is um, the individual who can provide uh, helpful information for the completion of the project. Uh, and they tend to have two-way communication, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, responsible and accountable. So they will, this can be like a subject matter expert. And they said, hey, you know, I think you should do X, Y, Z. You should do it in this order. Um, I'm not doing the work. You are. But here's how I would approach it. And then informed is more of one-way communication. Um, a good example here is somebody who just needs to know a status update. Like, hey, what are we doing? I don't really need to decide or I don't, you know, it isn't really um, my uh, expertise to say what we do. I just need to know because, um, you know, I need a status update because it might affect me later. So a good example here is, let's say, you know, the animation team is animating uh, the player cats for Katatui and um 
you know, as producer, I say, hey, VFX team, uh, these animations will be done in a week. Um, so then, you know, uh, we'll need VFX for those once they come in. They can just say, okay, great. You know, it's, they're just being informed of what's what's happening. Um, so some of the examples they use here as far as decisions. Um, so when they were creating the fellowship, right? Um, Elrond and Frodo were responsible for that. They are the ones doing the work or actually making the decisions where Gandalf was more um, accountable to make sure it got done. He wasn't the one doing it, but he had to make sure that happened. Um, or getting the ring to Mount Doom, right? We all know Frodo was the one doing that. Um, he had to make sure that got done. But Gandalf um, wasn't the one doing it. He was the one making sure it happened, right? So he was doing something like fighting the Balrog, right? He was clearing the way. He was providing assistance where he could to make sure it got done and unblocking, but he wasn't the one doing the work themselves. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how the racy chart works. Um, the idea here, again, is that you assign these roles around the decision and people agree to the roles and then you kind of move forward from there. So a new one I recently came across was what's called the rapid framework and very much so exploring this. Um, I, <laughs> Sam did most of the work. Don't disagree. <laughs> we can talk about it after. Um, yeah, Sam was what? Well, the whole the whole racy acronym probably right um anyway rapid framework um so another acronym of course uh in here we have recommend agree perform uh input and decide <clears throat> and so an example here and this is something I'm, i haven't used this myself but i wanted to show, showcase it it's pretty interesting um i listen to a good podcast about it and so let's say you are the level designer and you're designing let's say you're designing like the outskirts for Katatui, and it's like kind of where like the, the woods begin, right? And so you're in the recommend position. You're like, hey, I want to recommend that I do, you know, that we start a, a paper prototype of this level design. Um, and you're like, I need input. So you go to um, a designer, and the designer's like, oh yeah, the outskirts. Okay, so the trees. They have to be, they don't, they shouldn't have branch, lower branches so the cats can climb up. So we can like have a climbing mechanic. And you're like, okay, good to know. And then you get input from an animator. It's like, oh yeah, the trees, we, we prefer to do maple trees because we really want to like animate some like cool leaves instead of like pines. So, um, you know, check the, check the height of a typical maple tree and let's do that sort of thing. So you're getting input for your recommendation to make it stronger, to make it better and essentially doing like 80% of the work, like they mentioned here. But the input's providing critical expertise, information. And again, the recommender takes that information, but doesn't have to act on it. Um, and then there's a person who acts as the Greer. And they are basically making sure that the recommender is adhering to, in our case with games, adhering to the vision, adhering to the pillars. So, you know, this might be the lead, this might be the producer who's seeing what the level designer is doing and saying, okay, yeah, it's meeting, it's meeting all of our, our requirements for this milestone or for this, this design or this vision. Um, and from there, it moves on to the decider. This person kind of like gets everybody organized for the action, for what this decision would be, like who needs to be involved in this decision and then who needs to like follow up and like do the work if we make this decision. And then obviously you have perform. Um, this one says, this person says, yes, this decision, I sign off on it. So this could be, again, higher up leadership, like a creative director or a lead or an art director. Um, they sign off and say, all right, go for it. All looks good. So that's just another framework I wanted to share. Um, pretty interesting. Again, I haven't used it, but um, a good alternative to uh, something like the racy chart. Um, pillars of leadership. So this is not my concept. This is again from Ben and Aaron over uh, Building Better Games. Um, this was pretty interesting. Um, I kind of like this, so I wanted to share it, but again, not mine. Um, so they had this idea of the pillars of leadership or culture, vision, and process with these in, um, in order of importance. So if you think of like a, uh, you know, like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, um, culture's at the bottom, it's most important. Um, to a studio, to a team. And so there's two types of these that I want to discuss um, and that uh, they brought up as well. 
Um, and those are what are called intentional culture and incidental culture. So intentional is literally the rules, the roles, the, rec uh, the expectations that a studio or a team establish, you know, typically like literally written out like, hey, working hours are between this and this. Um, if you are taking PTO, you have to give us X amount of weeks of, uh, of uh, you know, um, a heads up. Um, you know, when you push to main, please, you know, do X, Y, Z. I'm, I'm a producer. I don't, I never use source control, <laughs> except on my own stuff. Um, no, but the, the rules that we all kind of know and that are established and are like written out and documented um, and that are decided typically among leadership and or through just doing the work and saying, oh, this works better, this works better. Let's establish this as an intentional culture on the team. Now, incidental is the more, in my opinion, the more important one. Um, this is things like tone, behaviors, um, content of communication. Um, and these are the things as a leadership you have to be super self-aware about. You, you have to even be self-aware as an individual. Like, what's the tone I'm using when I communicate? Um, you know, am I, okay, let's say I'm in an art director meeting, or I'm in, let's say, an engineering meeting, and, you know, one of the engineers, I'm a lead, and the engineer says, oh, it's going to take me, you know, um, an extra week to, to code, um, the the heat for the stove in Katatui. Um, you know, it, we want to do like a dynamic thing where depending on the season, the heat, the stove burns a little hotter. Um, and so thus it impacts your baking, but it's going to take me an extra week. And let's say as a lead, I kind of like get a little emotional about that or get a little upset. Um, the team's going to see that and they're going to not everybody, but some people might see that as an excuse for them to be upset when they deal with something that's either difficult or that they don't like. So you're almost modeling behaviors. Um, you know, this is something you have to be careful of, um, that you as leadership are modeling culture that you're not saying out loud or it's not written down, but it is being modeled. And so you want to be careful of this. Um, at the same time, there's a positive of this, right? Um, you know, calling out work that you thought was good or ideas that you thought were good or you know those sort of things like complimenting people's work um things like you're noticing the work that people's doing um these sort of things do help and add to the culture um and encourage other people to do the same um so again incidental super important you want to pay attention to that um vision i talked about this already this is kind of like the middle of the pyramid right if people feel comfortable at a studio Okay, the culture, I, you know, I can get along with most of it, um, but now I need to know about the game. What am I working on? I want to understand it. I want to make sure I get it and that this is something I want to be working on. And so the vision has to be clear. And again, it's the idea and how the game is, or how the vision is then interpreted into a game. That's, that's what the vision is. Um, like I mentioned, it can be a design doc, a single line idea, a sub point or a sub point of a sub point. Um, it just has to be out there for people to to get access to. And again, this is tough to do. This is work. Um, very often your work is people coming to you saying that they don't have the vision or they don't have the sub point of a sub point. And that's the work you have to do, whether you're doing it yourself as a visionary or digging it up. Um, and the last one's process. So again, this is at the top of the pyramid. This is like the least important need, but again, still pretty important for a for team to have. Um, and the idea of process is it's iterative, right? It can change. Hopefully it's not changing as you get farther in development, but we've all been there. Um, but you need process in place to take that vision and interpret it into actionable steps, actionable plans, work for people to do. Um, and so the idea here is decide on a process and move forward. Um, it's, not, it's not important what the process is, just as long as that the team agrees on it and can move forward with it. Um, you know, we often do retrospects um, where we get to the end of a milestone or a big point in development, and we say, hey, what's working? What isn't working? What do we need to change? What do we need to stop or start doing? That's a time to kind of tweak that process, right? It's okay that the process can change, just that you have one in place. So again, these are the pillars of leadership that um, guys over at Building Better Games kind of talked about. 
pretty cool. I like it. Thought I was worth sharing. All right, part four. So here's more practical advice, um, stuff you could use tomorrow. Um, these are these are again pretty pretty general ideas, but um, th things that I found pretty helpful, pretty important um, when acting as a as a leader. Um, so listening skills, right? I've talked about communicating as a leader. You're going to be a lot of doing a lot of talking, um, but at the same time, you need to be listening um, and hearing out the team and seeing where they're at. And so a great way to do this is through open-ended questions. These are the what, where, why, how. Um, basically questions that can't be answered um, with a yes or no, right? So, okay, if we're, if we're playing Catatouille again and you are a level designer and you're like, what, what the hell? Why, why can we only collect two bags of flour at night? I just, I don't get it. What's, what's that mean? Like, I'm not against it. I just need to understand. Like, that's an open-ended question, right? Like, explain this to me so I understand it. Um, maybe explain it in a little, or ask in a little bit better way than I did, but um, that's an open ended up uh, sort of question. And a good way to do these is um, reflecting or rephrasing. Um, and I do this constantly as a um, producer. Um, and that's the idea of, um, especially as a producer, because we, again, don't have super deep knowledge about the work teams are doing. We just have to have a high level to kind of like make this mental map. But what I'll often say is like, what I'm hearing is X, Y, Z. Um, it sounds like X, Y, Z. Or so I understand. It, so if I understand correctly, what I'm hearing is, and then I kind of explain what I heard back. And this is important to do because one, it gives the person the opportunity to, or one, it lets them see that I'm listening and that I understand what they're talking about. And then two, it gives them the opportunity to correct me if I am wrong. Um, if I am wrong, there's a chance that somebody else in the room didn't understand or somebody else in the meeting didn't understand as well. And so then it's bringing them on board too. Or if somebody is maybe just doing not a great job at explaining something, it gives them the opportunity to maybe rephrase it or like, hey, let me, uh, let me say it in this way. Let me try rephrasing that, what I, that explanation. Um, so again, super important, super easy to do. I'm doing that constantly just to make sure I'm understanding the work people are doing. So then I can either communicate it better to other leadership so I can make sure I'm getting they, them what they need, um, that sort of thing. Uh, ask the obvious question. Really easy to do. Um, in in <laughs> It sounds easy to do, but sometimes like literally asking the dumb question in a meeting is terrifying. Um, especially when you join a new team or you're maybe a junior or you're you know new to the team. Um, but as leadership, it's great to do. It is so great to do. I literally in, the, in a meeting this week asked, wait, what's the difference between a skeleton and a rig? Because I didn't know. Um, and when I asked, um, one of the team members goes, oh, you know what? We do kind of use those interchangeably, even though they're different. I could see how that's confusing. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. And so we talked about it. And like I now understand mostly the difference between a skeleton and a rig. But again, it's just to kind of ask that obvious question. Sometimes even the obvious question makes you realize you're like way down a rabbit hole and not on target and not doing potentially not going or potentially going down the route of doing the wrong work. And so it brings you back. Um, super, super helpful to do. Um, yeah, Sam says asking a dumb question is a superpower and I love doing it and when other people do it. Couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, skeleton and rig sound like the same thing, but they're totally different. Um, sort of. They're, they're, they work together, but yeah. Um, 3D. How does 3D work? Anyways, um, ask the obvious question. It's great. It's great to do. Um, it's definitely a superpower. Um, it helps. When people have done it to me, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm so close to this project that I'm not seeing the obvious faults or the obvious issues. And somebody asks a really basic question and it pulls me out of that. And I'm like, oh, I can get a high level view of the project for a brief second. And I can see some maybe faults or some things I was missing. Super helpful. Um, the last one is empathy. Um, <clears throat> so you, as a leader, you don't, by nature of being a leader, you don't always have visibility on a lots of part of project or where somebody's at with something. If they're struggling um, with work or personal issues, 
if they're really trying hard, but just, you know, banging their head on the wall. And then maybe that week their lead is out or their weed or their lead is swamped with a ton of other work. Um, sometimes you don't have visibility for that. So like give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, uh, let's say they estimated, Hey, you know what? It's going to take, we're trying to design the second tier bakery for Katatui. And we said two weeks, it's going to take us three weeks. And so, you know, I've always been like, okay, let's, let's talk about that. Like what happened? Why, you know, why did it, why did it balloon a little bit more? Um, let's just figure that out. And the idea here is not to like get them in trouble or to shame them, but to be like, <clears throat> what, what, like what happened? And I will help you and hopefully help you in the future, you know, meet that need that can maybe, um, you know, make it happen in two weeks or make a case for you needing three weeks to, to do that work. Um, so have empathy for your team, hear them out, um, you know, assume, assume, assume the best if you can. Uh, let's talk about meetings. Okay. So facilitation and meetings <clears throat> as a lead, chances are you'll have to facilitate, uh, meetings as a leader, you'll have to facilitate meetings. So basically this is leading the direction of the meeting, right? Um, and you kind of have this control. You kind of have this ability to not only drive the meeting, but also drive the tone and drive the interaction of the meeting. Um, you know, I will um, try and make sure everybody has the opportunity to speak up. Um, you know, we use Google Meet, so people will raise their hand, and sometimes a conversation will go on, and that person's not getting an opportunity to speak, I'll like jump on the mic and be like, hey, so-and-so you has your hand raised, even if the topic's changed. Um, so you want to make sure everybody kind of like has their opportunity to jump in um, and that we're also staying on topic, obviously. Um, is somebody taking notes? Is somebody, is it you? Or have you delegated that to somebody? Um, these are all important parts of facilitating meetings. So you walk away not just being like, oh, we just talked for 30 minutes and I don't know what we talked about and I'm going to forget, or I already did. Um, there's ways to check that. Um, you felt like maybe you had the opportunity, you were called on, so you had the opportunity to speak up. Um, facilitation, super, super good, super important. You can find a lot of information out there about facilitation and it typically works across the board. Um, this can even be, you know, standing up in a meeting and writing on the whiteboard. Um, so intentional meetings. So these are these are actually what we use at uh, Unknown Worlds, um, close to what we use. Um, and the idea here is there's like, if we're gonna have a meeting, there's gonna be three types of them. Um, they're gonna either be an information or status meeting, a steering or feedback meeting, or a decision-making meeting. If it's not one of those three, we don't do it. Um, we either have a Slack conversation or um, it's something we just keep exploring until it does meet the need for one of these meetings. So uh, an informational meeting or a status meeting, these are like stand-ups, um, team meetings, all hand meetings. Basically the goal here is to share information to a group of people um, in something like a team meeting, you know, as many people as you can at one time. So you have a large meeting, um, things like a stand-up. Okay, it's like a daily check-in. We're just getting a status um, update here. Uh, steering or feedback meetings. Um, so the goal here is to either give or receive feedback and then to potentially steer uh, the, the, you know, the vision, the work um, from there. So this might be something like a leads meeting where they're discussing the work that the teams are doing, milestone reviews, um, even um, um, we sometimes call them like gate reviews, like where we get something to a, a certain point. We're like, hey, let's talk about this. Is it meeting everything? Do we have feedback? Okay, we got to send it back, that sort of thing. Um, and then the last one is decision making. And so the goal here is these are these are the ones that um, you see uh, pop up, you know, like, um, I don't want to say unscheduled, but tend to pop up all over the place, decision making meetings. Uh, these are things like milestone planning, um, kickoff meetings, backlog grooming. Um, basically when there's a problem and you have to make a decision and it's just easier to have everybody in a room and talking about it. Um, but the idea here is try with all of these really, um, but especially decision-making meetings, provide as much information as you can prior to the meeting. Um, we will, um, in the event notes, uh, for the meeting, we will put 
the agenda, we will put the decision that needs to be made and we'll put the links to where information that can inform those decisions are. Uh, and then that will also be a post in Slack. Like the, your team's doing work, help them um, do less work to prepare for a meeting. Like they don't, they shouldn't have to go dig all that up. They shouldn't have to ask, what's the point of this meeting? Like it should be established. It should be out there. It should be clear. So then they can come into a meeting and you don't spend the first 10, 15 minutes being like, what are we talking about? What's what, wait, where's this thing? And you have to like provide links and all of that. Um, really help them to make a decision. Um, we've torn through decisions pretty quick sometimes. And it's, it's a great feeling to wrap a minute, a uh, meeting in 15 minutes to 20 minutes because people were, had the information and were able to come to a decision. So again, intentional, intentional meetings. Um, and then some last bits that, um, I'll kind of wrap up with here. Um, the idea of good enough. Um, this one's this one's fun. Um, so I think this applies a little bit more to smaller projects, maybe personal projects, but can definitely be applied as projects get bigger and larger teams. But it's the idea of getting your work to the good enough point and then moving on to the rest of your work or to whatever work is next. Um, that's not to say that you can't take a an asset or your work to great. Um, it's to say, like, get it to that point and move on. Because um, either one, you can come back and polish it, hopefully, um, if scheduling's being done. Or if you get it to, to good enough, it's so easy, especially in creative, uh, creative work, to just endlessly iterate on something or just kind of spin your wheels and be like, yeah, it's good enough, but it's not great. There's been times where I've moved on, and then when I came back to something, I had a different look on it. I had a different set of, uh, you know, a different lens to look at it, and I just, like, was able to solve it and make it great much easier. Um, if not, I've shipped good enough, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable with that certain things being good enough, and sometimes that's just a decision you have to make. Um, again, still exploring that, you know. Um, We'll see how I feel about that uh, moving forward. Uh, be mindful. Um, what works um, might not work for everybody, right? I um, I had um, I had somebody once say, "Hey, Rob, honestly, what I need is when do you need it done by? What time? And for this re or no, what do you need done by when and why? Like that's what I need, and I'm happy with that, and I can do my work." Um, but I also know that that works for them. That might be anxiety inducing for somebody else, like having something that direct um, rather than like maybe looking at a Favreau card or a Trello card and be like, oh, OK, I got to do this by this day and kind of do my work that way. The idea here really is like be mindful that what works for certain people and I work for everybody. Um, and that's kind of like where you learn to apply some of these concepts and this advice and see how it works. Um, persistence. Persistence is huge. If I see somebody being persistent, um, that's a killer quality. They can be doing, you know, very okay work. Not saying that that happens, but they, if they're persistent and like keep at it, like that's huge. Cause I know they're going to keep trying. I know they're going to come back, um, and like approach me or their lead about their work and just be persistent with it. Um, as a leader, this is good too. Um, this isn't saying like, keep pushing till you get what you want or something. This is like, just keep at it. If whatever, if one solution, one idea doesn't work or one solution doesn't work, move on to something else. Um, it's a great quality to have, obviously within reason. Um, you know, too much persistence can obviously be seen <laughs> as annoying. Um, but I think when you're persistent with your work and you keep trying, people notice that and it's, it's a good quality. And lastly, like I mentioned, um, be kind, um, as a leader, you're going to be working with people a lot. Um, and they're at the heart of all this, you know, chances are you are informing people of what work they should be doing or helping them do that work. Um, or, you know, kind of a force multiplier, like I mentioned. Um, but these are people at the end of the day be kind with them, be understanding, show empathy. Um, people are trying and, you know, chances are they know what they should be doing or they are trying to do their best, but people get anxious. Um, they misinterpret things. 
Uh, there are miscommunications happen. Um, it happens to us all. And I think kindness is always appreciated and recognized um, when doing this sort of work. So that wraps my talk. Um, here's a link to all my stuff if you want to check out my games, um, the music I've done. Um, it's all there. Um, but yeah, that is the end of my talk.